All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, let's get started. I hope that we can make it all to the end of what I have been planning for today. Let's briefly remind ourselves what we discussed last time. We have been looking into the notion of binary images. Um, as a matter of fact, we will not do a lot of analysis of binary images. They, at this point, serve as an important example for the idea of a collection of points. In the case of binary images, it so happens that um, we can think of all the black pixels in an image as a point at a certain coordinate. And um, where the image is white, there is no point. Well, we briefly discussed that last time. Um, I told you that these kind of images, if you save them, uh, of course, you might save them in terms of mm, standard image formats, PNG, JPEG, whatever. So usually they're being stored on disk as uh, intensity images, gray value images. Uh, but if we're given such an intensity image where the foreground pixels are black and the background images are white, um, we can apply this transformation of the intensities or colors, so we divide pixel intensity by 255. In the case of a white pixel, that would give us a 1. If we subtract 1 minus 1, that is 0. If the pixel is black, then this uh, is a 0. 0 divided by 255 is 0. 1 minus 0 is 1. So you see, um, with this simple transformation, we can indeed turn binary images into images of this form, where we say a binary image is a function uh, that assumes a value of 1 if the coordinate x, y is a foreground pixel and it assumes a value of 0 if it is a background pixel. So even though, um, from the point of view of visualization, this is the other way around, conceptually we think of binary images like this. Um, and again, the important thing is that in addition to this point of view as an image being a function, in the case of these binary images, we may also think of them as a collection of points. All the foreground pixels are a point in a set and the background pixels are points that are not contained in the set. And in that sense, uh, a visualization of a set like this is just a binary image. It depends on, of course, like what particular points are in that set, but we can think of these images as sets of points. And this is why we look at them right now, because conceptually, right now, at this point in time, they are sort of the easiest sets we may imagine in the context of image processing. We will later look at more interesting sets and apply the techniques we are going to learn about right now to these more interesting sets. All right. And then um, we looked at the notion of the moments of a bivariate function because, um, again, this, this is sort of the case we are currently dealing with, bivariate functions, that is functions defined over two coordinates, two variables x and y, and um, if that function is a continuous function, we define the moment of order p and q, p plus q, a q as the double integral x raised to the p, y raised to the q times g of x and y, then integrated with respect to all x and y in the case where the function is a discrete one, such as for all practical intents and purposes the binary images we are dealing with, um, in that case the integration becomes double summation. That is nothing special uh, and I already said that uh, if we look at these definitions of moments of continuous and discrete functions, we say that a moment is of order p plus q. Uh, as an example, we looked at the question of what is the area or size of a binary shape of a collection of pixels that, that would form a foreground object in an image. Um, and this is basically to sum over all the pixels in that image, all the foreground pixels. And this is basically to say that we are summing um, over x and y respect x raised to zero, y raised to the zero times g of x and y, and that is of course the order, uh, moment of order zero, the m not not moment. So here is immediately um, an immediate application of this 
rather abstract idea of moments. Um, we also looked into the notion of the center of mass or the mean pixel of a binary uh, shape, of a shape image, and saw that the x coordinate, x bar of this mean pixel is expressed as the moment m10 over m0, and the y coordinate, y bar of that mean uh, pixel is expressed as m01 over m0. And uh, of course, these two coordinates together form the mean vector of that set of points, something we have looked into earlier. Now, having seen the idea of the mean, we could then look at the definition of central moments in the case where, again, this function is a continuous function, we define the central moments to be, instead of m, I'm now writing mu, mu, p and q, as the double integral of x minus x bar raised to the power of p times y minus y bar raised to the power of q times g of x and y dx dy. And for discrete functions, we have the corresponding discrete equivalent here. And uh, I said that they are translation invariants, something that might come in handy later on. Uh, we also looked at um, uh, cases where, where these uh, abstract concepts actually manifest. And uh, in particular, we saw that the covariance uh, values of such a bivariate function uh, indeed correspond to these second order moments. In this case, I am showing you this for the case of a discrete function g of x and y, but that would also work for continuous functions. We see that the moment uh, mu to dot actually gives us the variance with respect to the x coordinate, uh, mu naught two gives us the variance with respect to the y coordinate, and then we have these mixed terms m11, all uh, mu11, all of these are second order moments. So the notion of covariance is tightly coupled to this rather general concept of a central moment of a function. Um, is, uh, it turns out that uh, these moments allow us to do much, much more. Uh, we can use them to look at uh, whether or not a function is skewed. Uh, all of this so far is, of course, still for the case of bivariate functions, but we can uh, easily generalize that to even higher order functions. Uh, and it also allows us to define the notion of kurtosis, but that was just an aside, something you know for you to store in the back of your minds, such that you have it available whenever it might uh, pop up again. Now, um, the real question we are going to address is, um, however slightly removed from what we looked into last time, that was just in preparation for what is going to come today. Um, our question at this point is, now if we are given a set of points, which in this example happen to form the shape of a horse, right? but to us they are just a set of points. All the black pixels here, this is just the visualization of a set of points. And this set of points is defined with respect to a certain coordinate system. In the case of images, that coordinate system is somehow defined by the camera when you took a picture and then, say, binarized it. But what we are interested in is the question, is there a sort of intrinsic coordinate system for that set of points, such that if we were to express the set of points in terms of this coordinate system, uh, the orientation of all these points and the location of all these points is somewhat normalized. For instance, here it looks like with this, uh, I've already, I'm already showing it, this intrinsic coordinate system seems to sort of have to do with the center point of the shape. Right? If we express all the points in terms of this intrinsic coordinate system, it appears that the center of the shape coincides with the origin of that coordinate system. And if we were able to determine, in our case, two-dimensional example, two such axes, uh, you see that if we express this set of points in terms of uh, the coordinates defined by these intrinsic axes, uh, then 
in this tricky example, the orientation of the horse is more natural. Right? It's not. It's very, very rare that you see a horse like that in nature. Usually, they appear like this. So, in a sense, the question we are concerned with right now in the context of binary images is, is there a coordinate system such that if we express the data we are given in terms of these coordinates, their orientation and location is somewhat normalized. Right? That is the problem we are going to study today. And last time I have already shown you this picture and we will get back to this right now. So, and um, just for the sort of sake of having it ever present to our eyes, I will uh, re-sketch it on the top right hand corner of the whiteboard. And of course my sketch will not be as beautiful as this graphics we just saw, but it is basically the same idea. So we have a coordinate system and then there is some shape, something like that, I really don't care. Um, and we are interested in a certain axis, no, it's an axis, not an arrow. And this axis has a distance to the origin and this point that is the closest point of this axis to the origin is called P0 and this axis also has, I will, hmm, where do I draw this? Let me draw it here, so because now you see my picture is getting ugly already. <laughs> this is uh, a vector d that indicates the direction of the axis, and of course it includes a certain angle with the x-axis, which um, I'm drawing down here. And I should have drawn it at the x-axis, but that would look ugly. Uh, this angle is called theta. This angle reoccurs here, so this is also theta. Then we consider an arbitrary point on this line segment, let's call it x0, and it has two coordinates x0 and y0. And then there is another point contained in this set um, that has a distance of r to the point x0, and this point will be called x and it has two coordinates x and y. So this is just a sketch um, for us to remind us of all the variables that will, uh, will occur. The distance from p0 to the origin is called rho. Just to remind us, uh, it is on the slides and uh, hopefully you have I don't know, sketched it last time. Now, um, we are interested in determine, determining the parameters rho and theta of a certain line and that line is defined by the shape or by the set of points right? um, and that line has a name and it's called the major major axis of uh, a shape, uh, like in our context, it is all about shapes. Uh, so we are interested in major axes, in the major axis of shapes. Now let me uh, begin with by rephrasing what we know about the point P0. So P0 is a two-dimensional point and its coordinates are given as minus rho, rho is the distance of P0 to the origin, minus rho, times sine of theta, and the y coordinate of P0 is rho times the cosine of theta. This uh, direction vector d is given as the vector where we have 
cosine of theta and sine of theta for the y coordinate or y component of this vector. And I note that uh, the norm of this vector is 1. So that makes sense, right? We have a vector, we have normalized it to 1. And um, check it at home. So verify this at home that the norm of this thing is indeed 1. And um, I guess we can all agree that the vector d defined like that points along the direction of that line. All right? And um, what do we know about the point x0? Um, one thing we may recall, I don't know, from high school or studies uh, as undergrad students, that we can express, now that we are given a point P0, a locus on the line and the direction of the line, can express any point on this line as a linear combination or a sum of P0 plus some parameter T times vector D. This is called the parametric, parametric a form, form of uh, the line, uh, line or line equation. I don't know exactly. Line equation. And um, if we plug in all our knowledge as to p naught and d into this expression here, we can express this in terms of its. Um, x and y components. Right? So for the x component, x0, we find that this is minus rho times sine of theta plus t times cosine of theta. And for the y component, we have rho times cosine of theta plus t times sine of theta. All right? We can all agree on that. This, from now on, is called 1. Um, you may have already guessed it. Uh, today I will write down lots of stuff. <laughs> Uh, it is, it is, we, we are basically computing things today, no? it, is, it's, it is actually just mathematics. Um, I don't know if you have seen what we are going to do today already, maybe you have, it is somewhat standard, um, but I need to do this in order to emphasize a certain property of the kind of lines we are interested in. Uh, so there will be lots of tedious computations and I might actually skip some of the intermediate steps because for the sake of time I have way too many intermediate steps. So um, quite often I will ask you to verify whatever I claim at home and it is really easy to do this because it just requires you to plug in stuff into equations we have um, plug-in stuff we have seen earlier into equations we're looking at currently and, you know, do the tedious algebra. But uh, I'll skip some of these steps for the sake of speed and a rather crucial insight shall emerge from all of this. Now, um, we may ask for the distance r between x and x0 and uh, I don't know, for um, convenience I will actually look at the squared distance because uh, that allows us to avoid square roots. Right? And this is of course, <coughs> please excuse my choice of language here, just um, the distance uh, or difference between x and x naught squared plus the difference between y and y naught squared. 
Um, and then we can plug in everything we know about x0 and y0 into these things, and I will really not do this. This is the uh, If you verify <laughs> all of this at home, you will end up with an equation that expresses r square as x square plus y square plus t square plus rho square plus two times rho times x sine of theta minus y cosine of theta minus two times t times x cosine of theta plus y sine of theta. All right. And now I will derive this thing. It starts here and ends here, so it goes over two lines and therefore all the stuff in between is even more extensive. You check that out at home. I will minimize this with respect to uh, t. And as always, minimize with respect to t. As always, we do this, well, as always, I shouldn't probably say, in terms of uh, differentiating it with respect to t. If we compute this uh, differentiation, we get 2 times t minus 2 x cosine of theta plus y sine of theta. And um, since we want, want to minimize it, we create that to zero. Right. This, this is the, as always, thing. We differentiate with respect to the variable for which we want to minimize that. Uh, we equate that to zero. And if we do this, let me, let me briefly continue this up here. We get that we can express t as x, well, this is really trivial, um, cosine uh, of theta plus y sine of theta. The two goes away, I can immediately divide by two, right hand side is zero, I divide zero by two, it's gone. Like these factors, so if I'm sloppy with the factors, here again you see why I'm sloppy with the factors, because we can immediately divide this by two, and then we basically have the solution for t, right? Um, and this result will be called two from now on. <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, why did we do this? Uh, in the end, we were interested. You know, I, I said that we are interested in r, r square, uh, and now we have done something that gives us a t. So let's use that. If we plug this result too into um, our system of equations in one, there were two equations there, we get that x minus x naught and y minus y naught is, and lots of tedious intermediate steps, uh, can be expressed in the case of x minus x naught, we get sine of theta times x sine theta minus y cosine theta plus rho. And here we get cosine theta x sine theta minus y cosine theta plus rho. Right. So the reason why we are doing this uh, the, the, the reason why I actually have done what I have done up until now is that um, these two expressions now only depend on theta and rho, 
but there is no uh, p not anymore. There is no vector d anymore. Of course, the d is very implicit, still contained in here, but we have at least eliminated this this p not, and now express this distance here just in terms of the two parameters rho and theta. Right? And um, now then, if we continue this and sort of like use our newfound knowledge as to the difference between x and x not, y, y not, to express the squared distance r, we find that r square is x sine theta minus y cosine theta plus rho squared. Verify that at home. Verify that at home. Right. This is um, Ah, okay, you have that, right? <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> now, <laughs> I should not have done this. Um, what happens if r square is zero? Like, what, what does it mean if the distance between some point to some point on the line is zero? Point is on line. It's a point on the line, right? So therefore, if we put a zero here, and can sort of, then this has to be zero, right? But if a square is zero, then sort of the argument is zero, and that is to say, by virtue of what we did up until now, we have uncovered another description of the line, right? If this is zero. Then it, it is to say that the corresponding x and y coordinates are points or indicate points on that line. Okay. Let me um, let me just briefly mention this here. If r square is zero, then x and y are on the line. Um, but this is to say, well, if we equate all of this to zero, we basically have, in our case, x sine theta minus y cosine theta plus rho equals zero. So this is another equation for the line. Right? This is why we did it, because now we have an equation for the line uh, without p naught, without t. It's a different way of expressing that line. Um, and I note, I note that we have uncovered, we have uncovered, how is it called, I don't know it myself, ah, the general form, <laughs> the uh, general form of a line. That is to say, like in textbooks, you'll probably find something like a times x plus b times y plus c equals zero. So this is a general form of a line equation, right? And we just found it again, you know, um, of course, I, was, I knew what we were searching for. So I knew what we had to minimize with respect to certain variables. But in the end, we find this. Right. In our case, a is of course sine theta, b is minus cosine theta, and c is rho. So we have that. Good. Now, um, now we look into uh, a concept from physics. What we are now interested in, now that we have expressed the line in terms of rho and theta, we now are interested in a certain choice of rho and theta. Now, given this collection of points, which I express in terms of an indicator function here, g of x and y, we want to find rho and 
theta, uh, which minimize, which minimize the following expression. It is called capital I, and it is a double integral, double integral um, x sine theta minus y cosine theta plus rho square times g of x and y dx dy. This thing is called moment of inertia. It's a physical concept. You can think of it as um, if you were to spin that shape, you know, rotate it about a certain axis, it will require more or less energy or force to do that. There is a certain axis, if you spin the shape about this axis, the force or energy you need to rotate it is minimal. If you spin it about another axis, it might require more force. Right? We are now interested in minimizing this thing. That is actually, we want to look for the line or the axis about what to rotate that thing such that we don't need much force or energy. How do we do that? Anybody, any idea? How do we minimize or <laughs> determine the minimizers of the expression? Mm, by doing it. Exactly, as always, as always. And uh, it, again, this is because it has uh, already this, this square form we are so familiar with or so eager about. Um, so I say, as always, uh, as always, um, we look at the derivative, now let's say with respect to this um, parameter rho uh, of this expression. And uh, let me write it down, this is the double integral 2 times x sine theta minus y cosine theta plus rho square is gone, uh, g of x and y dx dy. And as always, we want this to vanish, which is to say this is supposed to be zero. And um, let me, okay, I'll, I'll do this one uh, for you so you don't have to verify that at home. <laughs> and this is to say that, uh, look at this, we have a double integral uh, and in there there is a product. I can multiply this expression into the term with these parentheses here. And then I can actually express it in terms of um, a double integral over a sum of three terms. So I will now write it as three double integrals. All right, there's nothing special here. Um, but this is the double integral of x sine theta g of x and y dx dy minus the double integral y cosine theta g of x and y dx dy plus the double integral rho times g of x and y dx dy and all of this is supposed to be zero. I will call this thing three. Now, it's your time to tell me what I could possibly do to remove notational clutter here. Would you agree that we can pull out the sine theta out of the double integral? Mm -hmm. Does not depend on x and y. Right? So, if we do this, let me do it for you. So we have sine theta double integral x 
x, g, x, y, dx, dy. What is this here? Um, moment? Yeah. Uh, the radius. No, it's actually the um, first order moment. Yeah. yeah. Can you see this? It's one of the moments we have. So, this is to say um, that we can express this first thing as sine theta times m one naught. Okay. What about the next one? This is in zero one. Yeah. In zero one. Very good. This is minus cosine theta m not one, and the last one is plus rho m not not. All of this is supposed to be. Great. Eh? So uh, now you understand why I had to <laughs> introduce these things last time. Uh, and uh, I, of course, would not have had to do this, but now that we know about these things, it really allows me to write considerably less things. Because right? we could con continue like that. And writing all these integrals but I am always so lazy so we don't do that okay what I will do next is I will multiply 3 well, this, is, this is just one way of writing now 3 here is another way so this is both these things are equation 3 um, what would happen if I multiply this equation with one. Nothing, right? And um, that is something we want to re we want to do something with this. We are not quite quite there yet. Uh, we want to do something with it. And sometimes in mathematics, if you if you don't know what to do next, you multiply something by one. And you can choose that one such that if you multiply well, you can choose an expression for one such that if you multiply things with this particular expression for one, maybe some additional structure becomes apparent. That is, what we do now is we now multiply equation 3 by 1, where we choose the 1 to be um, m not not divided by m not not. That is 1. Okay? So if we multiply this expression with this guy, then we get, um, and I'm already factoring it out, m not not sine theta m one not divided by m not not minus cosine theta times m not one over m not not plus rho and here if I you know multiply then nothing happens so I'll just leave it like that plus rho okay. so if I multiply m not not by m not not over m not not and I pull out one of them then it's actually just now, again, your turn. What is this? Central moment. Exactly. There we go. These are the central moments. Right? So, let's rewrite this. <clears throat> and what I just erased is to say that uh, we end up with m not not times, and now I sort of switch the order here, x bar sine of theta minus y bar cosine theta plus rho equals zero. Right? Still on the right hand side we have zero. Now this is this this is actually 
the reason this result is what I wanted to, to show you. Um, this result is the reason for everything we have done up until now. What can we infer from this result? It tells us that the axis we are looking for, right, the one that minimizes the middle, has to pass through the center point of the set of pixels, of the set of points. This is what this says. And remember that with the couple of pictures I've, I've shown you at the beginning, there's, a, right, there's some intrinsic coordinate system, and uh, lo and behold, I, I sort of uh, put the origin of this intrinsic coordinate system on the center point of the shape. And here's the reason. This, this result, this intermediate result, tells us that the coordinate system we are after, its origin is, or that the line that we are after, has to pass through the center, center point of the set of pixels. Okay? So this is the axis, the axis we are looking for, looking for, has to pass through through the center of this well. indicator function g of x and y. Oh. Note that um, we are talking about all of this in terms of g of x and y representing a set of pixels or a set of points, right? because you know we talked about binary images, but in all the calculations so far uh, we never actually used that, so you see it is more general than, than, than the particular example we are discussing right now. Um, and therefore, you know, it does not have to pass through the center pixel, but sort of to the center, let's, let's say center of mass, I should say center of mass of mass of g of x and y. So in general, right? For us, this g of x and y is just an indicator function, a function that produces a binary image, so the center of mass is the center pixel. But it could be some weighting function, and then uh, would be the center of mass. But, but here it's the same. Okay, um, and now um, earlier generations of students were always quite upset with that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is a result that is way more interesting than trying to determine rho. I really, I couldn't care less about rho anymore. I said we are going to determine rho and theta such that uh, the, the axis you know, gives us the minimum uh, moment of inertia. And uh, we set out looking for that rho. Um, and now I will not continue looking for that rho. Right? Because I, I already have found a point on the line. Which is a good thing. Right? We, we, this, this tells us that the center point of the set of points has to be on that line. We don't need rho. This is, this is you know, very disappointing maybe for you because I, I said let's, let's determine rho and now I'll, I'll, I'll quit. But what we found here is actually way more important. And it's, 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 you know, it's the same. It's, it's sort of good enough. We, we don't need to, because we, we have seen that the line has to pass through this point. But we don't know about theta yet. And that's the next thing we are going to do. So theta will have actually uh, will have to be determined. Um, so that is to find find theta that minimizes minimizes one. We change the coordinates. Coordinates. 
this is also this is you know um, is just a trick to to minimize notational clutter. I will define a new x coordinate x prime as a function of the original x coordinate x minus x bar and y prime is y minus y bar. So um, I hope that we can all agree that um, you know in the original coordinate system we are given we are talking about points x and y but we can compute x and y bar for the set of points we are given and so we can indeed compute this expression for every point x and then we define the result to be x prime and this is of course to express the set of points in a coordinate system where the origin now is x bar y bar and we just sort of shift it by, by means of this change of variables just shift the shape from some arbitrary position such that its center point now coincides with the origin and um, then, and I'm almost done. Uh, and lots of stuff. Um, so far, we know a couple of things, and I'll write them down. First one is x times sine theta minus y cosine theta plus rho equals zero. This is the line equation we sort of met on our way. Line equation. And uh, we know something else. And we know that x bar sine theta minus y bar cosine theta plus rho is zero. This is because x bar and y bar is a point on that line. Point on line. These are two facts we have uh, uncovered so far. Um, and from these two facts, we, we, have, we have that. Um, x minus x bar times sine theta minus y minus y bar times cosine theta equals zero. What have I done here? I have just subtracted this one from this one. Right? And if I subtract zero from zero, nothing will change. But the row goes away. The row goes away. And um, this is to say, you know, now you see why I sort of hinted at this change of variables because here I can write x prime and y prime, right? So we have x prime sine theta minus y prime cosine theta is zero. Okay, um, <laughs> well, hmm. you know what, um, for the sake of time I'm trying to hit home way more today than, than I probably should have tried to. Uh, next thing is I will uh, skip a lot of intermediate steps. Let me just see if I can do that. So, with what we just found, we are able to sort of re-express our expression for, for this uh, function i here, for this, this, this moment in the i, as the double integral, let me write it like x minus x bar sine theta minus y minus y bar cosine theta squared g of x and y uh, dx and y um, 
basically writing all of this in terms of um, the new coordinates, which I have not done here uh, because I'm going to skip a lot of steps. Um, but convince yourself that we can do this. We can do this. And um, now there is a lot of dots <laughs> for you to you know, sort of simplify this integral and to find that in the end this evaluates to mu 2 naught uh, sine square of theta minus 2 mu 1 1 sine theta cosine theta plus mu not 2 cosine square theta. Okay. Uh, verify this at home. We have already seen how these um, moments sneak in, right? We did that more or less explicitly once already. Now, if this is tedious, but it is straightforward. You do it. You verify that this comes out of it. Okay. <clears throat> okay, um, then we recall these um, addition theorems for sine and cosine, so I hope they are correct. It's always a matter of debate with uh, students. <laughs> uh, a plus minus b, sine of a plus minus b. Um, we should be able to write it as uh, sine a cosine b plus minus cosine a sine b and um, I hope that is correct. I did my best to... Uh, is it not? Is it? Okay, yeah, sometimes I, I get confused but I just want to point at these uh, addition theorems for sine and cosine, right? And if I sort of get confused with, with the order and you know what at least I'm hinting at and you correct if there are mistakes. And for cosine we have um, cosine a plus minus b is cosine a cosine b and then minus plus sine a sine b. And we use that. Um, we have we have now we have this um, uh, 2 sine theta cosine theta. We can express this as um, sine of 2 theta. This is somewhere hidden in here. I really have to speed up things a bit. Um, this was one expression in what I just erased. Right? And we can rewrite it like this. Um, we also had an expression where there was a sine square of theta, and this can be written as cosine square of theta minus cosine of 2 theta, or as we know, sort of 1 minus cosine square of theta. And this is to say that cosine square of theta can be written as 1 plus cosine of 2 theta. This is, I probably skip all this over 2. These are just uh, some, some facts about how we can re-express what I'll rewrite right now. So, therefore, or thus, thus, we have that this i, which is mu 2 naught sine square theta minus 2 mu 1 1 sine theta cosine theta plus mu naught 2 cosine square theta. This can be written as lots of stuff using all these things here. I'll write it as 
1 over 2 mu, I have to be careful now, mu 2 naught plus mu, uh, mu naught 2 plus mu 2 naught minus 1 over 2 mu naught 2 minus mu 2 naught. This is times cosine 2 theta. And here we have minus mu 1 1 sine 2 theta. Okay, so I hope uh, that is correct because I skipped lots of stuff here using all of this. But now we are basically done. But now we are basically done because um, we can finally solve for this theta using this trusted recipe of deriving this. And this gives us um, mu oops, equals, so the derivative of i with respect to theta gives us mu 2 naught minus mu naught 2. It can, this one does not depend on theta, by so it goes away. Here, uh, the 1 over 2 cancels with this 2 from the uh, derivative here. Um, sine 2 theta minus 2 mu 1 1 cosine 2 theta. All of this is supposed to be 0. And that tells us that the angle we are looking for, well, we have sine of 2 theta divided by cosine of 2 theta is 2 mu 1 1 over mu 2 naught minus mu naught 2. And this is to say that the angle we are looking for is one half of the arctangent arctan of this expression 2 mu 1 1 over mu uh, 2 naught minus mu naught 2. The order here is really important. If you compute this, then it is mu 2 naught minus mu naught 2. Okay? <sighs> okay, good. We're done. You can now use that. You can now already use that to normalize the um, location and orientation of a shape. And why not just do it, you know? Um, get yourself some binary picture, uh, get all the coordinates of the, of the black pixels, of the foreground pixels, and then um, compute the center point and sort of shift the computer transformation from the coordinates you're given such that the origin now coincides with the center point. Then compute the central moments. And once you have the central moments, you can compute this angle theta and then rotate all the points by this angle theta. And you will see, say for the case of the horse we looked into earlier, you will get just what we got. All right. So what we have learned so far are two crucial things. Um, the first one is that this major axis we wanted to determine passes through the center point, or this g is, is not an indicator function, but some, some more evolved function to the center of mass. And the second point is that for the case of two-dimensional functions, right, we have to be careful here, but for the case of two-dimensional functions, we can express the angle between this major axis and, say, the x-axis of the coordinate system we are given in terms of a function of second-order moments. Right? This, this uh, theta is the arctan of something that depends on second-order central moments. And, and this, this is... Uh, these two facts are the reason why I forced you to this right here. <laughs> um, because, once again, a binary image 
is just a collection of points. And these points are two-dimensional and we can plot them. Right? This is, it is an example for a very general um, setting which we will use next week. This is an example for a very general setting which we can sort of verify visually. A binary image is just a set of points. We can plot the points. We can ask if there is a coordinate system uh, implicit to these points. Something like, you know, a, a coordinate system that is somewhat defined by the set of points itself. And um, we are on our way to uncover that in general and for the 2D case where we are basically dealing with, okay, we have to define one two-dimensional line. If we have one, the other one will be perpendicular to that. Right? Um, we have now uh, found that the origin of this implicit coordinate system defined by the set of points itself goes through the center of the set of points and that for the 2D case we can express the angle of this major axis in terms of the second order central moments. Um, and we will generalize this to point sets in arbitrarily high dimensions, so not just two dimensions, next time. Um, but for now, I hope, let's see, let's see how, <laughs> how far <laughs> we, can, we can take all this. Um, yeah, time is running out, but let me see. What we just did, right, uh, maybe you have seen that before. Have you? Um, it's, it's nothing, nothing special. It just sort of prepares ourselves for things to come. And again, it's a preparation with respect to a problem setting, to a problem domain, two-dimensional points, which we can visualize and therefore sort of visually verify that the results we get make sense. Right. Um, I will now switch gears. And uh, I only switched pens because the black one was uh, leaving me. <laughs> so, um, but it's, it's, it's actually a great, um, great moment to, to also switch colors. It's not, not so much a semantic statement but because of the pen. But what we are doing right now is the same from a totally different viewpoint. Uh, we will now look into the problem of computing the principle, or I should probably have said major axes via matrix diagonalization. Diagonalization. <laughs> and before we do this, um, let me point out something to you. Um, I hope it fits on this whiteboard. For starters, for start, this is a preparatory remark. Let us assume that we are given some basis, and I shall call it B, and we consider um, two vectors in this basis B. We talked a lot about basis and coordinate systems last semester, so I'll not do it again. Um, we assume that there is a vector Z which results from applying a matrix to a vector X. All right. So we are given some vector expressed in this basis B and there is some operator and I really couldn't care less about the details of this operator but there is a matrix we multiply to x we get a new vector z. Right. The only thing I care about is sort of the, the dimensions of the matrix and the vectors agree but that's, that's, that's basically it. But this is scaling or rotation or whatever I don't, I don't care less. And now we consider a transformation from the basis B 
from basis B to another basis B prime by means by means of an invertible matrix operator invertible matrix operator operator M again that is something we studied extensively in the last course that is to say if we are given um, a vector Z in the basis B and we consider this transition from basis B to basis B prime which is to say by multiplying this change of basis operators to Z we get this vector Z expressed in the new basis Z prime all right and of course the same applies for the vector x, x prime would be the result of changing the basis oops, of vector x. Okay. And um, Is that for the sake of space? Under those, these two sort of initial conditions, we you know, have some vector x and produce a vector z by means of some operation A. And uh, we have a basis B and another basis B prime, and we can express the vectors we are given either in the basis B or in the basis B prime. Under these two conditions we have um, then, well let's just sort of invert this equation. I said that M is supposed to be invertible so then we have that the vector Z is M inverse times Z prime. Okay, no problem here. stupid but anyway <laughs> uh, but this is the same as if I were to say that it is um, the matrix A applied to um, M inverse X prime I should not have done it in this order, but anyway. This M sort of allows us to switch back and forth between basis B and basis B prime. And at the same time, we know that Z also results from X by means of some transformation. Right? Um, and I probably should have made it explicit. X is M inverse X prime. And um, AX gives us Z. Right, so this is AX. Um, but that, you know, again with some algebraic mumbo jumbo, um, we can express something about Z prime. Z prime is, and this is this is why I'm doing all this. M A M inverse x prime can you see that okay and um, the crucial thing is this thing here I will now call this a prime so z is also a prime Now, what I wanted to point out for starters is that if we are given 
two vectors which are related in terms of an operation A in a certain basis system and we know another operation that changes the basis system we can express the two vectors in this new or other basis system and in this other basis system they are related by an operation that is different than the operation in the original basis system but this operation A prime can be obtained from looking at the transition from the one basis to the other looking at the operation in the original basis system and looking at the inverse from the transition between the bases. This is, check this out, this, I should probably change the order in which I derived it. But that, that thing here is crucial. Okay, so now, yeah, I really, did, I have to change that. I'm not happy with this, I'll make this um, a promise uh, next time. I'll argue this in a more concise, more, more principled manner. But uh, the argument is um, valid nevertheless. I'll, I'll derive it differently next time. So, um, here is the idea. Idea. Given. Let's look at a matrix. And uh, let me call it um, matrix C. And uh, let's say this matrix were to contain second order moments mu mu one one mu one one mu not two and you know they can also write this as a b b c so from now on instead of, of uh, carrying around all these uh, mu's and subscripts i'll probably refer to them as a b and c um, now why, why would i look at a matrix like that we just saw that in the case of 2d points the angle that defines the major axis of a shape of a set of points uh, depends on these second order moments. Right? And we already saw that these second order moments, central moments, um, indicate variance and covariance. And so therefore, you know, I just look at the covariance matrix. Right? You know, there are the, the three ingredients for the angle are contained in this matrix. We can agree on that, right? And now um, we are interested, interested in a transformation. I consider a transformation of this matrix. Uh, let's call it T, T, T inverse. We saw this expression already. Right? It was called M and A, but now we have T and C. But uh, this is basically what we just uh, saw. And um, now we saw uh, we can sort of understand this matrix C as some operation in some basis system and then we can sort of transform this operation into a new basis system. This is what we're doing here. Right? This, is, this is what was A called on the, called on the previous slide, this was called A. Now it's called C because it was called C all the time. But we are now looking for a transformation of this matrix, a certain transformation. And I want the result of this transformation, of this matrix, to be a matrix lambda. This is supposed to be the capital uh, lambda, Greek letter lambda, capital, where, and this is why we are doing all of this, the form of this lambda is as follows. It is a diagonal matrix. Which is to say, it has a value lambda 1 and a value lambda 2 along this diagonal. It's just you know, two dimensional uh, vector spaces here. And the off diagonal elements are 0. This is what I want to have. That, that is, our task is to find a transformation T that takes C into lambda where the result looks like this. Once we have that, I will reconnect it to the principal axis again. Okay, 
And all of this is to say, I'll put it here, different way, you know, just um, sort of uh, say C times T inverse is the same as T inverse times lambda. And I just multiplied both sides with T inverse, I can do that. And now, by now you know that I am lazy and I'm too lazy to write T inverse all the time. I really am. So therefore, I will call this C times a matrix V is the same as the matrix V times lambda. And that is to say, I implicitly sort of defined here V is T inverse, right? So instead of solving all of this for T inverse, we will solve it for matrix V, and once we have that, we can invert it back, no problem there. All right, how far can I take this today? Uh, let's see. Let's see. case we are currently looking at everything is is in terms of two dimensional points right we are still uh, this matrix this covariance matrix c was a two by two matrix this is we are still mentally focusing on the case of binary images which we understand as a set of points I'll, I'll stress this because what we are doing here is way more general and we'll look at that at the time um, we have that the covariance matrix, as well as this um, transformation operator V, as well as the matrix lambda, the diagonal matrix we want to, to obtain, all of these are two by two matrices, and they are matrices with real entries, okay? And in particular, in particular, we can understand the matrix V as a matrix consisting of two column vectors. It's a two by two matrix, so it has two columns. And I will call this V1 and V2. These are the two column vectors of the matrix V. And of course, both of these two vectors, Vi, are two-dimensional vectors, right? because then this is a two-by-two two matrix. And so therefore, um, therefore, did I have a name? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll skipped a lot of stuff today and now I insert stuff. Let's see. Um, what we just saw on the previous whiteboard was this equation C times V equals V times lambda. And I will write this like so now. We have C times V1, V2 equals V1, V2 times lambda. Now, on the left hand side, this is a two by two matrix, right? Because it's the product between a two by two matrix and another two by two matrix. So this here is um, a two by two matrix. Mm -hmm. But if we have that on the left hand side, it must be the same on the right hand side. Okay, mm -hmm. problem there. by two matrix. But this two by two matrix is the product of a matrix and another matrix. 
And we can think of this product as applying this matrix to the first column in the second factor matrix and then applying it to the second column and that gives us the two uh, columns. Mm -hmm. So this is the same as C times V1 and C times V2. Can we agree on that? We can, right? Um, <laughs> now, this is a diagonal matrix, right? which is sort of a generalization of the unit matrix. If we multiply this, this with this, it basically it scales the columns of this matrix, right? So this is the same as um, the value lambda 1 times V1, and the second column is given by lambda 2 times V2, the vector in the second column V2. And <laughs> I did all of this because, um, yeah, I had to in in insert it on the fly because I said, Therefore, 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 we have that matrix C times vector y i v i is the same as lambda i v i. has to be the case because in the first column of this matrix we have C times V1 in the first column of the matrix on the right hand we have lambda 1 times V1 and so on and so forth it's, it's like that what is this? exactly this is an eigenvector eigenvalue equation so very good lambda I is called an eigenvalue eigenvalue of matrix C and this vector VI is an eigenvector eigenvector of matrix C and these are definitions these are definitions um, whenever we have an equation where we have a matrix times a vector on the left hand side say can we it doesn't matter right but say on the left hand side and on the right hand side we have a scaled version of that vector which is to say that applying the matrix to the vector is just scaling the vector right? if we have such an equation then these vectors which are just scaled by matrix C are called the eigenvectors of C and the scaling factors are called the eigenvalues. Now, I will uh, quit it at this point because this is a good uh, break point. Um, but note this, if we could somehow determine the eigenvectors, we would have found the columns of the matrix V. If we have the matrix V, we have the transformation matrix T that turns the matrix C into a diagonal matrix. As it so happens, the entries along the diagonal are the eigenvalues. So I'll quit it at this fundamental point here. This is an eigenvector eigenvalue equation and we stumbled across it because what we want to achieve right now is we actually want to diagonalize the matrix C. And how we do that for the case of two-dimensional vectors we will study next time and then we will generalize all of this from 2D point sets to 
point sets in arbitrary dimensions and see how it relates to image analysis. Great, that's all for today. Are there any questions? We I think now Landy was minimizing the equation three. I mm -hmm. guess the, when we were actually derivating the equation in half inertia with mm -hmm. theta, what was the motivation behind? Because the other thing was very clear when we were actually derivating with respect to the distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay, because yeah, then yeah. there we are actually finding the mean yeah, 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 yeah. in the center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the thing is, um, um, one, once again, uh, now um, we have a certain coordinate. Let me call it the basis. I don't even care, right? Some, some, and some point set, which I don't know, something like this. Um, and there are, of course, many different axes that uh, pass through this thing. A lot of them, right? But we are interested in a specific axis, and here it will probably be uh, something like this, such that, say, if we were to rotate it about this axis, the force or energy is, is as small as possible. If we rotate this thing about this axis, we will need lots of force. Um, this axis can be expressed in terms of a direction vector and some point on that line. Um, but it can also be expressed sort of in terms of its uh, distance and uh, angle theta. So the distance to the origin and the angle theta are two parameters which in 2D perfectly um, express that line. We were interested in, in rho and on our way towards uh, determining rho we found, ah, the thing is actually to go through here. Which I said, this is even better. Is even better than you know trying to figure out this. This way, it's much cooler to have a locus on the line, and we found it has to be on, on that line. But there are uh, a lot of lines that, that go to this thing, right? So we still have to find the line that that sort of has a certain um, I don't know this like you know, some, some whatever theta prime, theta two prime. We are interested in that one. That was what we. Uh, that was actually clear. That, yeah. was, uh, uh, that was actually clear that we need theta in order to have the orientation yeah. of that line. Uh, my point was, uh, my question was that uh, how we, I mean, maybe a very fundamental one that usually when we do find the derivative, we are actually are finding the saddle point that at the minimum or the maximum. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. here when we were finding the derivative of theta and setting it to zero, what way in which direction we are going? Oh, uh, I, I have difficulties trying to figure out what you are asking for, but um, again, we, we followed this, this usual recipe where we say, okay, um, we have to determine this um, angle theta of the particular line that minimizes this. And so um, we did it, right? So we, we had some expression for this, um, for this uh, moment of inertia. So we have the uh, vi v theta, and I skipped lots of steps because it's, it's really it's way too much writing down. But in the end, this is really has not much to do with image processing. So you know, okay. you do it at home. But um, we found um, by skipping a lot of intermediate steps, which you can easily really like retrace at home, that it's uh, mu two naught minus u not 2 um, and there was uh, sine 2 theta and then minus 2 u 1 1 um, cosine 2 theta and again we required this to be 0 so this is, is, is the, the usual, usual approach we had some expression for this if we derive it with respect to theta we get this if we equate it to 0 um, we hopefully get the theta that indicates the line with the minimum moment of inertia. And, and then we actually solved this for theta and found that it's given as uh, an arc tang of uh, second order moments. Any other question? So again, um, 
and then, then we're done. What we did today uh, has really basically nothing to do with image analysis. What we did today was, um, when, we, when we did this, we actually looked at the problem in physics. Like finding the axis that if we rotate this thing, force or energy are small. Um, I, I don't know if, if you had uh, physics courses during your undergrad studies, you may have seen this. Right? This, this is nothing special. This is, this is sort of one of the things you can solve perfectly, where we know okay, it has to be like that. There's no, no, no problem there. Right? Um, but I did it because it beautifully reveals the fact that this axis has to go to this point. Right? This is something we cannot immediately see from diagonalizing the covariance matrix. All right, and we will continue diagonalizing the covariance matrix next Monday, and it will take it to higher dimensions and, and more general principles. Great, thank you very much.